that falls after November 1st to be All Saints Sunday. And we remember those whom we have lost from our community of faith in the last year, and also those we welcomed in through baptism. And so we'll be talking more about that through the worship, but um, welcome to those who um, came today as uh, family and friends in support of, um, of those who have lost someone um, this past year, and for those who came to celebrate the baptism as well. Um, let's see, we have flowers. Thank you, Ginger and Lonnie, in honor of Reed's birthday. So how is that possible, right? They, it just time flies. We stay exactly the same, and they get older every year, right? So congratulations to Reed on his birthday. And um, just a few announcements. Um, let's see. Thanks, everybody, for kind of hanging with last week's schedule. I was out a little bit, but um, good news is I tested negative for every possible thing, so um, I am definitely well enough to be here with you all today. Um, so confirmation class continues this week, uh, Wednesday at 6 p.m. for our 6th, 7th, and 8th graders. Uh, reminder that the women's Bible study moved to 7 a.m., so you can sleep a little extra. And um, we have uh, a whole other list of dates below to save the dates for as the month continues. Um, a Blast Thanks Living event on November 15th, uh, where Young at Heart will meet. Um, and then reminder of our, um, our uh, annual meeting, which is um, two Sundays from now. And on that note, I'll invite Scott up, and he'll share a reminder and invitation for that, as well as another announcement. Good morning. So again, as uh, Pastor Trish mentioned, in two weeks we will have our annual meeting. Uh, we'll be approving the budget for next year. Uh, so a possible expenditure. Uh, to replace our elevator, so really encourage you to come and learn more about that and participate in the life of the congregation. The other uh, item that I'm excited to talk about is, if you recall, at our last congregational meeting, uh, the, the uh, con congregation had endorsed a reconfiguration of our open position, open staff position, um, and from that conversation and discussion, we uh, redid the job description and created what we are calling the Director of Community, Faith, and Engagement. And so this person, uh, if you recall, will uh, continue to focus on uh, community faith development within the congregation, but also is uh, we are shifting some of those responsibilities to also uh, in ensure that we are out in the community and working with the community and for the community. And so uh, really we're broadening that, the focus of that position. And uh, want to, uh, really excited to announce that uh, we have hired someone for that position. And uh, they, this is somebody familiar to the congregation. So uh, Coralie Vale, who uh, is often known as Lance's mom, uh, <laughs> but will, yeah, the, you, that's right. And uh, so we'll uh, want to make sure that uh, we, we know that, that now this new role, she's going to be more than just, uh, just the parents of two wonderful children. So if we could uh, thank uh, and welcome Cora Lee to uh, the position. Uh, so she just started this last week and uh, will familiarize herself and start to get things organized so that uh, hopefully after the holidays we'll be uh, up and, and running full force. So be on the lookout for uh, wonderful opportunities uh, as we move forward. So really excited. And I also want to thank, uh, and I'm not going to name them all because there are a couple of different uh, iterations, but want to thank the search committee uh, that has met with a few candidates uh, over a very long period of time, uh, 12 to 18 months. Uh, so really thanks to everyone who uh, participated and a special thanks to the congregation for uh, being willing to shift the focus of this position, and uh, I think we're, we're all really excited about the possibilities and also 
uh, even more excited about uh, the person who uh, is joining us. So uh, thanks very much, and uh, let, let any uh, council member know if you have any questions or concerns. Thank you. Thanks, Scott, for sharing that good news. And uh, I, too, am excited and ready to look forward to um, having a, uh, a full staff at our congregation for the first time in a while. So um, thank you. And uh, a reminder that today is also first Sunday of the month, others first breakfast. And so you are invited to stay after for um, food and for fellowship. The um, the free will offering that we collect at these breakfasts, um, this month is designated to um, companions in the Merindy Parish specifically for um, scholarships for those youth that we support going through um, the school program. And uh, is that right, Kathy? Okay, thank you. And um, so uh, please um, stay after and uh, enjoy breakfast. Also, you'll notice, and you might have been invited as you came in, um, there is a giant set of butterfly wings hanging out in the narthex. And you'll all be invited at one point to um, have a picture taken in front of the wings. And we'll be compiling sort of a, um, a collage of that in honor of our planning for next year's ministry and our theme of imagining a world transformed and set free. And we use the butterfly as our image for that changing from the caterpillar to the butterfly. And um, thank you for those who have uh, returned the information we requested on financial giving and a reminder just to um, please send that forward to us as we continue uh, to put together the, the plans for um, how we will move forward together in ministry next year. I invite you to please stand as you are able, and we begin our work of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, in whose image we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. We join together in the prayer of the day. Let us pray. O oh God, generous and supreme, your loving Son lived among us and struggled with us in the ways of humility and justice. Continue to ease our burdens and lead us to serve alongside of him, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let you all be seated. And excited to announce that the Glory Day Choir is making its uh, debut. Yes, thank you. That's the word I was searching for. 
And then we heard this special verse. We heard, may your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So we hear in the Bible that Jesus is the light of the world, but then he's the one who tells us we're light too. And we go out to shine the light of God's love and God's grace and the message of uh, forgiveness and another way of being in the world. And that is our job as saints. Saints. Yes, you are saints. Every single one of you. All of the baptized um, 
first lesson is from the third chapter of Micah. Judgment upon corrupt rulers. Micah chapter 3 verses 5 through 12. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray, who cry peace when they have something to eat, but declare war against those who put nothing into their mouths. Therefore it shall be night to you without vision, and darkness to, to you without revelation. The sun shall go down upon the prophets, and the day shall be black over them. The seers shall be disgraced, and the diviners put to shame. They shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer from God. But as for me, I am filled with power and with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and might, to declare Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Hear this, you rulers of the house of Jacob and chiefs of the house of Israel, who bore just, abhor justice and pervert all equity, who build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with wrong. Its rulers give judgment for, the, for a bribe. Its priests teach for a price. Its prophets give oracles for money. Yet they lean upon the Lord and say, Surely the Lord is with us. No harm shall come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion should, shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins and the mountain of the house a wooded height. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> the second lesson is from the second chapter of 1 Thessalonians. The apostles' teaching accepted as God's word. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 13. You remember our, our labor and toil, brothers and sisters. We work night and day so that, so that we might not burden any of you while you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how pure, upright, and blameless our conduct was toward you believers. As you know, we dealt with each one of you like a father with his children, urging and encouraging you and pleading that you may lead a life worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. We also constantly give thanks to God for this, that when you received the word of God that you have heard from us, you accepted it as not as human word, but as what it really is, God's word, which is also at work in you believers. This is the word of the Lord. Before I read the gospel, I'm going to take this moment after that sharing of the fact that we are standing on holy ground and that we are recognizing the angels all around us. Um, as we take a moment and remember those for whom the candles, um, the candles stand. So as I told the kids, the Christ candle shines to remind us of our baptism and of our dying and our rising into Christ. In this holy bond, we are connected to one another in the communion of saints. The large candles then represent the saints who have died in our Gloria Day family of faith in the past year since last All Saints Sunday. So we remember the faithful witness of Ruth Sutton, Donna Height, Lee DeWitt, John Steepman, Dorothea Johnson, Carol Cutler, and Ken Engbritson. 
The smaller candles represent the newest saints who baptized into Christ in the past year, and we celebrate them as our partners serving in the gospel for Ava and Briggs. And then the small white lights placed there by the children. They remind us that we are saints, but also that there are saints yet to come who will carry on in the faith in ways that we can't even yet begin to imagine, but that they are part of that vision of imagining the world transformed and set free. And our trust and our hope is in Christ, that the mission carries on until he comes again. You may be seated. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 23rd chapter. Oops. Sorry, I threw the... I threw the tech people a loop by doing that. So I will read from here. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 23rd chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, therefore... Do whatever they teach you and follow it. But do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear, and they lay them on the shoulders of others. But they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for the, they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. They love to have the place of honor at banquets and the best seats in the synagogues and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have people call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all students. And call no one your father on earth, for you have one father, the father in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant, and all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the gospel of the Lord. Who is your saint? You remember today. Who is your saint who is shining light in that group of candles there for you? Who's the one whom you long for and for whom you give thanks? I invited the children to mention a name as they lit their candle. And I wonder if we might just all take a moment now, all together, to name the saints we are remembering out loud. Zach. The chorus of all those names is a prayer. And we offer to God our loss, our grief, our sorrow. We also offer to God our love, our gratitude, and our joy. You know, no matter how recent or how long ago, this remembering we do, it both hurts, but it heals. This remembering is not only to stir our pain, but it also gently cradles the gift of that person who, the gift of who that person was to us, for us, and with us. And yet this day of remembering all saints is really not a day meant for lingering in this realm of death but it is a day for dwelling in the promise of new life. And we can't deny the reality of death, but we can come together as a community and we can defy death's claims on us. 
So the Holy Spirit has gathered us here to worship. Worship as we who are the company of saints here and now. We who are bound together in Christ. And here we are supported by one another. Supported by one another in the promise that this communion of saints, this community of saints, will surround us, will wrap us in faith in those moments when our own faith doesn't sustain us. So the candles are lit. They're shining bright in memory for the saints who have died. They are lit in thanksgiving and in remembrance of baptism, the newest saints from this past year. And we are in that number. We're bathed and washed in the waters of the font. We are claimed by promises that are bigger than ourselves, named as saints, children of God, now, right now. So remembering our baptism is not only for the, new, the newly baptized, but is also for us, for all the saints. And in a culture that lifts up saints as someone who's extra good, otherworldly, sort of like an angel, as Joy said, someone self-sacrificing, maybe like a Mother Teresa or a Nelson Mandela. We hear the word saint, and we resist that title. No way, we say, a saint can't possibly just be someone like you or me. But that other definition of saint, the saint that the world lifts up, has made us forget the promise. The promise that claimed us at that font as a child of God. The promise that marked us and sealed us with the cross of Christ forever. We are flawed. Yes. Undeniably. Absolutely. We are sinners. There is no argument there. But still. Still and yet, we are set apart. We are blessed by God's endless grace. So you and I, we are the saints. And this day is for all the saints, the ones who've gone before, you who are here now, and all the saints still yet to come. But then there's these scriptures. These scriptures today, ugh, they push us and they challenge us. They hold up a mirror to us and to our world. They remind us of war, of suffering, and of injustice. They talk about false prophets and teachers. They remind us of those we put into positions of power who are inauthentic and self-serving. As we hear those reminders, well, perhaps we are rightfully reluctant to accept that title of saint. But the pages of history tell all the stories. Well, the sainthood wasn't our idea. No, it's been thrust upon us. It's been thrust upon us by a God that we know ought to know better than to call us saints. Oh, we know better. We know ourselves. I mean, even on the best days, we're far from perfect. Claiming that title of saint seems fraudulent. Saint? Not me. And that is precisely why we who are reluctant saints gather. We gather for this reminder. Reminder of the assurance of God's promise, God's claim on us. God's presence in our lives. And this promise is not a reward that is to be realized in some far away heaven, but it is a gift of pure grace. It is the love of God that is here for us now, right now. The struggles and the losses of this life, the brokenness we experience is experience in ourselves and in the world, they still leave us longing for help. They leave us crying out for a savior. But as we pause to remember the saints who have died, 
as we take comfort in their witness to God's steadfastness. We give thanks that this is a day for the living, for you and I, for everyday saints who are wading through a world where there never seems to be a shortage of death that we can mourn. Lives that are taken by violence and hatred, by storms and fires. Lives that are shot down in malls or mowed down in city streets. The saints who have gone before us carried the message to us. The message to keep the faith. The message that there is an assurance of hope. The message that this is not the final say. This is not the final answer. Whether we're faced with personal loss or the suffering of the world, this promise is something each one of us can cling to. It's a large crowd of saints we are gathered in, bigger than we could possibly imagine, and we are in their number. It's a number infinitely endless, infinitely diverse. But when you think about it, do we ever really get a handle on God's grace? God's grace is infinite and endless. God has promised a big promise that's not just to us. It goes way beyond us. So it gives us the hope to imagine that we might be part of God's mission and vision for a world transformed and set free. the offspring that God promised Abraham and Sarah that would be like the stars of the sky, like the grains of sand on the shore, that they would be blessed to be a blessing to all the nations. We are in that countless number of saints. And God's big promise reveals that we are part of something so much bigger than ourselves, something that is life-changing and life-giving. Something that moves and stirs us, not just to sit around and be blessed as saints, but to also live as a blessing. This sainthood that was thrust on us, thrust on us by a God that should know better, it takes us places that we don't always want to go. And we find ourselves doing things that we don't always want to do. What Jesus was referring to, right? That people who are exalted will be humbled. And those who are humbled will be exalted. That doing the ministry and the work of God takes getting our hands dirty, serving others, lifting up a world that needs love and light. So, as sinners, resisting God's gift of love, sinners who resist God's gift of life, and yet as saints, saints who seek to embrace the light and the life and the love of God. This is reluctant sainthood. All of us, reluctant saints, going forward out in the world, sent by God to show God's love, to shine God's light. Even when we are absolutely certain that we are not up to or qualified for the task. God puts God's trust in us. God imagines that we can serve God in helping God create a world that is transformed and set free. And that we can do so by sharing the love and the story of Jesus. That is a story of death, but also of new life. Of things that need to be put to death and new things that come out of them. 
Jesus didn't need to be put to death. He humbled himself. He followed the will of God. It was inevitable, right? I mean, he's describing that world right there and when he talks in the gospel. That's how he ended up in the cross. People that are doing things for themselves, things that just show that they're the important ones. People that do things that trod on the lowly, the humble, the least of these. And sometimes we're those people. But those things were put to death. They're put to death on the cross. And we are all raised together as saints through the gift of baptism into new life. So almost every week, almost every week, sometimes it gets it gets cut out um, for sake of other things that are happening in the service. But almost every week we confess our faith and we use the words of the Apostles' Creed. And in the Apostles' Creed, there is that part about the communion of saints. Now, this is not a confession of faith in a communion that we hope to be part of someday. But we are confessing our faith in the communion that has happened, that is already happening. We are confessing the hope that is all around us and within us. A lot of times people don't have communion at... Um, of funeral services. Partly because, well, it's just an added extra thing. It feels like so much adding it into that service. And then, um, you know, there's going to be different people coming. And, and will they feel welcome? Or will it be something where they feel awkward about coming to the table? And I can appreciate that. I've thought some of that myself. On a day when we are trying to hold the family close, those sometimes those extra details, worrying about that, providing the grace at the table can get in the way. Providing grace at the table could get in the way. How could that sentence even be possible? I'm reminded of my seminary professor, Mark Banger, who was our worship professor. Definitely a high church guy. All the bells and smells bring it all on for worship. Nothing was too complicated, too fancy, too much. Well, some things were. Like women weren't supposed to wear nail polish, but, you know, he's a man of his day. So he said something. He said something about communion to us during our worship. Communion is a moment where we cross over into a time that is in between. A time that is all times at once. That that profession of faith that we say in the communion, in the creed, when we say the communion of saints, that this communion that takes place with all of us here, present, drinking wine, eating a bit of bread or a host, that those moments cross over. And that when we do that, we are communing with all the saints. All the saints. The saints before and the saints yet to come. And when they come, when they're there in the here and now, they'll be communing with us. And it just continues to grow. That countless cloud of witnesses of the community holding us, embracing us together. And so he, he shared his thoughts that communion always ought to be part of a funeral. Because we're communing with the one who we're saying goodbye to. The one who is 
yet still always with us. That moment, that communion moment where we're sharing God's grace together across time, across space, it's a mystery of our faith. We can't explain it, but we can feel it. And the promises are there for us that what is happening isn't just in our heads, but it's really taking place. And there also could be made an argument for communion to be for the youngest among us. That your invitation to the table is really your entrance into the fun. That at any time a child is able to take a little bit of juice or bread or host or wine, that they participate in the entire communion of saints. It's good that we learn the promises. It's good that we understand those things. But this is way bigger than all of us, this grace that we have entered into, this love and forgiveness we have entered into, the power of it all that defies death and that brings about new life. So today, when you commune, think of those you are communing with. That really, the sanctuary is full, it's crowded, it's packed to the gills of the saints communing together. And remember that you will be one of those saints that others remember. And you will be communing with them, communing with them as saints to come. This place of worship then could be filled. Like I said, not just imagine that it's filled with everyone, but it could be filled with the light of endless candles. Candles that represent the light that shines before others, light that gives glory to God in heaven. And that despite our own reluctance, despite our objections, besides the fact that we know better, that God ought to know better, God can and does work in us and through us. By the grace of God that's revealed in Jesus, we are all saints. All saints. And perhaps we could pray again one more time. But maybe turn and say the name of your neighbor sitting next to you. Remember them as a saint of God. Thanks be to God for all the saints. Amen.
thanks today and proclaim that we are not alone. Our voices of praise are joined together with saints of old and saints of days yet to come. We praise you for your promise of hope that enfolds every generation with your sustaining grace. Heal our divisions, show us unity in your presence, and send us to love the world as you love us. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Holy Creator, we marvel at your creation that is revealed in the cycle of seasons, changing landscapes, and the rise and the fall of ocean tides. Turn us from selfish consumption and open us to gentle healing of the earth so that all creation Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Holy Advocate, we lift grateful hearts for the ability to vote and elect leaders. Grant wisdom to those who will be elected and grant safety to poll workers. May civic leaders serve the whole community, especially all who are underrepresented or oppressed. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Holy Healer, Bless the brokenhearted and all who mourn. Send your compassion to all who grieve. Grant wholeness to all who are sick. And accompany those who are dying. Be near to all who need you. Especially all those for whom prayer has been requested on our Gloria Day prayer chain. And we lift them before you now, either silently or aloud. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Holy Comforter, we pray for this congregation that the promise of your new life may be shared and experienced. We pray for the funeral ministry of this congregation, that families and friends seeking your love and hope will find it here. And we lift once more before you our loved and remembered saints who rest in your light. Ruth, Donna, Dorothea, Lee, John, Carol, and Ken. And we give thanks for our call as a community of faith to baptize and to teach. And we lift once more Ava and Riggs, our partners in the gospel. Guide them and all of us so that all of our light may shine to bring glory to you. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Holy One, for the saints of ages past, the saints here and now, saints yet to come, we give you thanks. Praise you for the eternal life we all receive through Jesus Christ. Send us forth this day to imagine, along with you, a world that is transformed and set free. Lord, in your mercy. We offer our spoken prayers and those held in our hearts. And we trust in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord.
turn on you and be gracious to you, the Lord look upon you in favor and grant you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. 